Well, we'll, we'll get um, cracking on. Hopefully more people um, can join us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Cooper, and I'm co-chair of the Co-op Party Disability Network. It's my pleasure to welcome you on International Day of Disabled People to the network's event on social care and also where next for the network. Since our conference event at Co-op Conference 2020, the network has held a number of other events and engaged with members across a range of topics. And we submitted two documents to the party's policy process based on your thoughts and ideas from our big conversation events earlier on in the year. Tonight, the social care document is the basis of tonight's discussion. And what a timely theme for our discussion. The recent government announcement on Wednesday regarding social care is inadequate and will fail to deliver the necessary change needed. Never has a cooperative alternative that empowers disabled people and provides them with appropriate support been more needed. So I'm delighted to welcome our fantastic panelists who will kick off tonight's discussion with some initial thoughts before we open up to an interactive discussion. We have Cheryl, a fellow co-chair of the Disability Network. We have Valerie, Mervyn, and hopefully Jonathan, who are all excellent steering committee members. So before I open up to the panelists' introductions and reflections, I need to show a few technical things in terms of running this meeting via Zoom. I'm sure most of you have heard all of this before, but please do bear with me as I uh, run through it all. Firstly, this Zoom call and the discussion is being recorded. Many of our members cannot access it live, so we'll be making it available to view uh, via the Co-op Party's YouTube channel. Therefore, if you don't want your image to be seen, please switch your camera off and go on audio only. To make the content of this call clearer, you've been muted. Only those speaking will be shown on screen or have sound enabled, but you should be able to unmute yourself at the appropriate points when I bring you in. Following the presentation, we'll be opening the floor to discussion. There are ways that you can get involved. Obviously, you can speak uh, when we introduce you. So you can click on the icon labeled participant at the bottom center of your computer or phone screen, then click the button labeled raised hand. Your digital hand will be raised so that we are aware that you want to make a point. And it's much easier for me to do that than if you wave, I'll be able to see you. If you do the digital hand, I might not be able to see you. If you just wave at me, I will introduce you and you'll be unmuted. You can also contribute to the discussion in the chat box, which is being monitored. At appropriate moments, I'll be reading out some of the comments. We also have closed captions available if anyone needs it. And if you need help on how to get the closed captions working, I'm sure one of my colleagues can help you. Throughout tonight's event, there's going to be a number of polls for you to answer. Your response will be anonymous, but they will provide the steering committee and the network as a whole with some really valuable feedback. Please respond if you can, and I'll be making sure everyone knows when the questions pop up. Finally, the cooperative party believes that our values should be reflected in our action as well as our policies. We want all members and all event participants to feel safe, welcome and respected in our party. So please ensure you respect this when making your contribution today. So I've said enough, it's now time to pass over to our panel before opening up to your reflections and discussion. Cheryl, over to you first. Hello, um, as Ben said, I'm the co-chair of the forum and the committee. I'm also quite a seasoned cooperator, so I'm a member of a cooperative called Change Agents with Mervyn, who'll be speaking later. I'm the vice chair of Co-ops UK. And um, with Change Agents, we've been doing some work with Cone Valley Care around something that uh, we're developing called Fair Care, which is very similar to Fair Trade. And it's based on bringing people together. And what it looks at is just what it says on the tin, that any care, and I'm Irish ancestry, so for me, care is cara. The, the root word is friend, more cara, my friend. And that we should have um, a caring aspect to care so that there is a responsibility within cooperative care for the person receiving care, for the person delivering care, for the friends and family, that we all have ownership. And I'm talking about ownership, 
not as is usually considered in most businesses that are cooperative, that it is share ownership, but I'm talking about sharing beyond finances and I'm talking about caring that is mutual caring between all members and ownership, not just as pound shillings and pence and shares, but ownership as agency. We're also looking at this in terms of care and how it's situated within the country and the people who are the active decision makers. And we've been calling this within um, the committee, disposable people, that if you look at care, the people who are in receipt of care, the disabled older people are considered disposable economically unviable. They are less cared for than contained or surveilled, regardless of age or disability. If you look at the people who deliver care, the hands-on people, the carers, they are the lowest paid people in this country. Frequently, people are discussed as disposable in as much as if they leave that employment and go into other employment because it is better paid and people need pay for obvious reasons, then we can just go around the world just taking the poorest people to be exploited and bring them here. Now this idea that we can just exploit people who are carers and people who are cared for, and that is a viable way of delivering care, it's just coming to an end. And again, if you look at those people, who are those disposable people? The older people, disabled people, low working people, working class people, vain people. We have to end this cycle of exploitation and lack of caring. So that's me and that's Fair Care. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, Jonathan isn't here at the moment, I don't think, but hopefully he will be joining us soon so i'm going to uh, move over to valerie valerie over to you thank you chair um and good evening everybody ben um i hope you're all doing well um it's cold outside so i hope you're making sure you're putting your layers on um so yeah my name's valerie i'm recently elected um in islington south and finsbury in a lovely ward called bun hill and i'm one of the um many amazing um cooperators on the disability network and um, I have my own um, hidden disabilities and visible disabilities. And um, for me, um, this, um, I guess this subject this evening's um, quite um, personal. I may might not know, but um, I was once, um, I worked in social care um, in my teens and um, I really struggled um, because of the amount of pressure that was put on me as one that looked, you know, quite strong and able to, to care for those I was caring for. And um, I think, um, I guess the basis of what I'm going to talk about this evening will be on about campaigning and um, how we develop a model, a cooperative model that will actually give um, workers um, better rights. Um, at the moment, we can see the government is, um, you know, they know that there's lack of um, employment at the moment and people are leaving social care. But they're also now um, saying to, to the workers that you need to be vaccinated. And there's quite a lot of issues in terms of being vaccinated. Some are for, some are against, and everyone has their own, you know, personal opinions or experiences why they have their own, you know, um, doubts or, um, I guess, um, valid reasons for why they want to have the vaccine. But it's quite sensitive issue, especially in the, the Black and Asian minority ethnic community, especially when you've seen through various reports and figures that many have seen that over time they've basically been ignored or been used um, within the sector to just be workers and now all of a sudden they want to care for them when they didn't even give them the right PPE at the start of the pandemic and they were left literally um, high and dry. Um, there's one aspect I guess as well in terms of social care which underpins it which is to ensure that it prevents um, obviously deterioration of someone's health if they um, have various you know disabilities whether it's hidden or um, visible um, to promote physical and mental health and their well-being that's really important 
and um, also to promote um, independence and inclusion and I guess social mobility and opportunities. And um, there is this thing of like, I, I remember um, on the network, I think Teresa always says there, is it something like, and I never get this right, the idiom, um, nothing without us or something like that. She can put it in the chat because I always get things muddled, but um, there is something that needs to be said about the amount of people that work in, um, even in the care sector that have disabilities and that are really the best of carers and often don't get paid and they don't get the recognition. Um, a lot of um, people care for their families and obviously they don't expect to have the pay because they're doing it out of love. But there is this thing of like the guilt, you know, of even asking for even respite. And which is something that I used to do when I was working in the care sector, which was to give families respite. And I think that's one thing we need to talk about, um, which is that, you know, in every job we get time, um, you know, off work and, just as, just as much as if you're caring for somebody, you need time off work to deal with your mental health, being your physical health and all the other um, isms that you need to look after. Um, the care system as well, um, I think is broken, just like with most of the things at the moment, this government is not funding it, funding it, funding it properly. Um, neither is it advocating um, that we get the right workers or that we get the right training. And that's something that's really quite sad. We don't promote in our schools, I mean, our colleges. And um, it's just, um, if we're not careful at the moment, obviously with Brexit, with a lot of um, international workers um, leaving us, we won't even have any home um, carers, those that are from you know, our homelands to go into the sector. Um, um, I don't know how long I have now. I don't know if any of you can point fingers or something, I've lost track of time. Um, probably have it to have a minute. Um, but I just um, think it comes back to local government and um, the lack of funding that we have at the moment. I've sat on a few um, committees and I've um, been in, you know, sort of like disbelief, the amount of money that's not given to local authorities and how many agency staff have to be used. And, you know, just just the, the sadness is that um, we're meant to support um, our community and as the local government, we're, not, we're, un, we're unable to because of the lack of funding that comes from the national government. So I guess going forward, what we need to do is um, ensure that we keep campaigning and we keep um, you know, just advocating that we need the right funds, we need the right education, the right training and opportunities for those that access um, care and um, those that also want to care for people that need the care. So it kind of goes um, both ways. And that's the cooperative model I think we should be, um, policies we should be going forward with. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. I can see Jonathan's here, but I'm going to go to Mervyn first to give him some time uh, to prepare. Mervyn, over to you. Okay, thanks, Ben. And uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Mervyn Eastman. I'm a colleague of, of Cheryl, of course, and uh, my background is in social work uh, from the age of 18 uh, right through and continues into my 72nd year. So that I am wedded to social work, I'm wedded to issues around social care uh, and um, presently been involved uh, over the last, I don't know how long, Cheryl, uh, two decades in relation to the cooperative, but particularly around change agents. And very recently uh, was involved in helping to set up uh, the Later Life Audio and Radio uh, Cooperative, uh, which is designed to give uh, particularly older people, but others, a voice, a direct voice, without it being filtered through uh, agencies or, or public and, and civil society. I suppose what I would want to share with you uh, and have been asked to share uh, later uh, is the main thrust of our submission paper uh, that we uh, as a, a network uh, submitted to the COP party in June. Uh, and the background and the backdrop to that wasn't at that time um, the white paper, because uh, that was just a fantasy uh, that we thought may or may not happen. Uh, but as Ben rightly said, it was published on Wednesday uh, and I've had a chance to read it. Uh, and I think that when we come to look at uh, what the cooperative way might be, 
uh, in relation to social care, uh, we need two things. One is uh, to make a judgment uh, against what we were saying in relation to our submission uh, and how far the white paper uh, meets that, uh, as well as I think uh, because of today, uh, we need to benchmark it in relation to um, today being the International Day uh, of Persons with Disability. And I was reminded um, this morning uh, that that, uh, that day, today, uh, actually really wants to promote equality, uh, wishes to um, uh, reinforce disability rights and, and protecting well-being, uh, and also breaking down the barriers to inclusion and fighting for individual and, uh, and their disabilities. So we've produced a summary for you, uh, beginning of our submission, uh, but let me just make one or two points. One is, we need very clearly, particularly in the context of the white paper, uh, which in my personal view, this is not a view of the cooperative party or the cooperative movement, this is a Mervyn Eastman view, which I want to share with you. And that is that we need to define social care in its broadest context. It is not just about physical uh, contact. It's not just about f meeting physical needs. Uh, it's far more taking into account, account the social determinants of care and of, and of health generally. And that means, therefore, uh, that when we are talking about disability, uh, Valerie was kind enough to share her experience. Uh, in, uh, my experience in relation to uh, mental health uh, dates back some 25 years ago, uh, and one that still uh, casts from time to time a shadow in, in relation to uh, my own well-being. But social care has to take place, we would argue, in the context of income, employment, housing, leisure, uh, community safety, transport, um, and particularly one of the areas that we have in Change Agents been advocating uh, with the network, and that is around community development, uh, and also placing it uh, very clearly in the context of um, Principle 7, which is concerned for the community. So if one looks at the white paper and judges that, we are arguing then in June and arguing now uh, that we need a transformative approach to social care, having defined what we mean by social care. And for us, it's about revisiting uh, the Taking Care report that the Cooperative Party produced in 2016. It's also about being human rights based, uh, but it's also primarily for me and reinforced in our submission around addressing social inclusion. And the white paper talks a lot about choice, control and freedom. But when you look at what they're saying in the body of the white paper, it doesn't mention in any real way the issue of community development. It repeats the same menu of services that are presently offered, but just funding them better. And I think for us, uh, in terms of the disability network and for the Cooperative Party generally. Uh, it's about that. Let me just finish on this point as well, because I know Ben will be anxious, and you may all well be anxious. Uh, and that is, we do not spend enough time looking at the issue of growing older with a disability. And we often define old age and ageing purely in, in the context of disability and not realize that many hundreds of thousands of individuals with a disability are growing older with that disability. And that brings into play issues around not disabledism, but issues around ageism, sexism, and so on and so forth. So what our submission tried to do was to broaden out uh, the landscape, to broaden out the debate. Because uh, otherwise, what we'll end up with a white paper, and I've been through so many white papers over my 40 years in social care, is that the rhetoric seems to be in the right direction. But in terms of the reality facing people living with a disability, growing older with a disability, it remains rhetoric. It means nothing because it's too limited in terms of vision, in terms of aspiration and in terms of shifting the power imbalances that exist within the provision and the commissioning of social care. I apologise in advance, Ben, for taking liberties with your good nature. 
No, thank you very much, Mervyn. I never get anxious when you're talking, even about very serious um, subjects. Um, so I'm going to now move over to Jonathan. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I know you've had some internet troubles, but Jonathan, over to you. Hopefully you can hear me and the sound's okay and I'm not sounding like a Dalek. Um, <laughs> I mean, my my personal ex, uh, ex, uh, experience of background is um, I'm a carer for somebody who is disabled with severe mental illness, um, rapid, by, rapid cycle bipolar disorder, and I myself um, have a history of anxiety and depression. Um, and we know that the when it comes to social care, it's a postcode lottery. What you get in one authority is completely different to what you get five miles up the road in a, in a different authority. And we actually know that, and it, you know, it doesn't actually matter which party is in charge of your local authority because actually, you know, you can have two conservative councils, you know, literally next door to each other, or two Labour councils literally next door to each other that have vastly differing uh, policies when it comes to social care, when it comes to the charging, you know, and, and we have this fragmented service and for years we've had, you know, governments talking about the fact that social care is important and it should, you know, and it's, it should be in there with the NHS because of the way that they obviously work together in the, you know, trying to ensure that the NHS isn't being bed blocked by people who, who, um, you know, need care to be able to actually leave the you know the hospital and hs system and actually return to you know living in the community but what what's my experience of social care in my area is that um when it comes to mental health and social care it's non-existent um i'm a carer i have my own mental health issues um my local carers organization carers in bedfordshire are brilliant and they will point you and you know tell you what all your rights and and um, entitlements are. But when you actually then go to the local authority and say, oh, I want a carer's assessment, for example, or, you know, I need, an, I want an assessment for my brother's needs. The response you get is, in my case with carer's assessment, they came out, had a lovely little chat. This was pre-COVID and said, yeah, you're coping fine. We don't need to offer you anything. Not okay, you're coping fine, but what, what respite might you need for your own well-being or, or anything like that? It was a case of, you're coping, that's fine. Um, and trust me, you know, it's, it's, it's the situation of, you know, uh, of what I call the swan. You know, you, you look graceful and elegant above the surface, but underneath, you, you know, you're paddling away like mad to sort of keep, keep things going. And so, yeah, so I get no no support as a carer. We get no support from social services for my brother, um, for, for anything for him either, you know, in terms of respite from me as his, as his care or me having respite from him, because quite frankly, we, you know, we, both, it, we both need it. Um, and this is despite the fact that, um, you know, his condition is such that he gets full now, element, both elements for PIP. It seems to me that social care seems to be very much um, still focused on on the medical model, not the social model. It's very much about you know specific conditions, people you know with. Quite frankly, it seems to be very much biased more toward physical conditions, um, yeah, and, and visible disability than than, than non visible disability, and so. Yeah, the, the work the co-op has done is is good. And let's face it, you know, we've seen the white paper. The white paper, as they always are, is inadequate. And even for the areas that it's tackling, such as you know, care for older people, it's it's discriminatory. You know, it's it's one rule for you know, effectively one rule for the rich, one for the poor. They say, oh, you know, when when you know, Labour politicians have stood up in Parliament and said. What about somebody who's got a property that's worth, yeah, in the you know, in sort of the north that might only be worth eighty thousand pounds, a hundred thousand pounds? Effectively, they're going to have to sell it to pay for the care. The government says, no, they're not. You don't have to sell your home. 
both are telling the truth because actually, yeah, you don't have to sell the sell your home whilst you're alive, but as soon as you pass away, that's it. Your estate gets clawed back. And that's that's the lie of, of what the government is saying. So I think I, my summary is, yep, yeah, social care, very much a fragmented system. It needs more than tinkering. You know, it needs a substantial overhaul. And it needs to actually look more at the social model rather than the medical model. And it needs to actually cater better for the spectrum of disabilities that are out there. And I think I'll leave it there so that more so people can actually participate. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, so we've had some really interesting contributions there around the need for reform and fair care and the social model of disability and funding local authorities properly. Lots to talk about and also around uh, the challenges of the workforce. But first, we have some questions for you, which hopefully will be able to um, pop up. There we are. So there are six questions. Uh, like I said at the start, they're all anonymous, but we really want to get some feedback on who's contributing today, um, what your priorities are, and um, other related things. We've got another set of questions, which I will bring in probably around about quarter past uh, seven, and then we'll finish at half past. So if everyone can fill those in, and I've got to do it as well. If you don't want to fill it in, they're the next in the uh, off top right corner. I will also read um, all of the questions out. So we have number one, are you a carer for a friend or family member? Yes or no. Number two, do you provide over 50 hours per week of care? Yes or no. Number three, have you ever had to give up work to care for a family member or friend, yes or no. Then number four is, do you think the current care is allowance rate of £37.25 a week? I think that is, is adequate, yes or no. Do you, then number five is, do you believe this is an issue for the corporate party that is social care and the care is allowance, yes or no. And number six, do you think the Cooperative Party should win a campaign to push Parliament to agree to an immediate and substantial increase in the amount of care with allowance, yes or no? Now, I've taken some time to do that, so hopefully everyone will have responded. Um, I'm going to say that people have. Um, I'm not 100% certain if we get the answers, uh, the answers, the poll results during it, but if we do, I will read them out. Um, so who wants to go? First, reflecting on social care, what you've heard, um, your own experiences, if you want to bring that in, uh, but also what more the network can do, not only on this topic, ideally on this topic would be great, but more broadly. I can see Andrew. Uh, Andrew, you're first, if you want to um, unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Right. Um, well, for um if you look at the background that i'm actually sat before you'll you'll hopefully notice there is a military theme there and that is because i am actually a disabled gulf war veteran um and like many of the people who have already spoken i have a invisible disability um i've been very interested to hear um some of the speakers that they've men mentioned um human rights inclusion access um that is a bit of a bugbear for myself um one of the things that i've got very interested in is um the various support dogs that disabled people can get i mean everybody knows about guide dogs for the blind and guide dogs for the blind get access to everything however um as i say over the years the number of and types of support dogs has greatly increased particularly in the area um, of mental health and yet these support dogs 
are not recognized they're not recognized and and so the owners and let's face it their support dogs is part of their caring package um can't get access because their support dog is not allowed access and so they miss out on inclusion they miss out on accessing normal public services a visit to the library for instance which they cannot do um and so this for me is all part of the care package um also although i'm i don't have a carer myself um my wife actually works in the private sector in um mental health hospital um she's a nurse and and from what she tells me the issue for the carers even in the private sector is extremely difficult so it's it's not just um to do with uh, excuse me it's it's not just to do with carers that are are funded through social care but even those that are being that are, are there in the private sector are still greatly undervalued um the the problems that um that my wife tells me about of the number of carers that are desperately needed at, at the hospital she works at um and so it is definitely something that we need to get hold of because the the carers are really having a hard time and they need to be fully supported so um good job to all of you that are that are doing that work and um i'm i'm happy to to have met you all thank you thank you andrew and thank you for um, sharing that um i will go to anthony next hi um yeah uh this is such a wide-ranging um topic that i don't think even half a day would would do it any sort of justice um for my i've got personal experience of of uh, older social care through older relatives um my mother had um uh, long-term disability mental health and uh so, so I've, I've seen social work and social care from that part of view i've got hidden disability mental health issues which means that uh from having from running my own business and, and having a career as a as a biomedical scientist i now can't work um but i've been thinking about this quite a lot uh in the recent months and i think there's two major things that need to to happen uh now to try and improve the situation for everybody with a disability. One of them is um, disability financial support needs to be removed from the DWP. The DWP is not fit for purpose for disabled people. Basically, um, at the last budget, even at the last budget, uh, we are rapidly becoming non people. Absolutely becoming non people. Um, it's all very well saying that, um, you know, you can um, improve your your income by working uh, just that little bit harder. What happens when you can't work at all? What happens when you've worked yourself into into almost the grave because that's what happened with me i did everything right and then um because i'd done everything right i ended up uh, not being able to work and then um the uh, 
David Cameron left me a stranger. For that, I will never forgive him. And I will never forgive the Tory party for that. Never. Um, now, the, the other aspect that I've been thinking about is um, we need to have, and I hope that it happens um, in the next uh, Labour government, we need cabinet level uh, disability representation because disability is not just people in wheelchairs, it's not just people um, who have accidents, it's people like me, it's people like the rest of the people um, here today. And the other thing is, like the previous uh, speakers were saying, as you get older, you have specific issues. You know, you're not just getting old, you're getting old with a disability. So it's a double whammy. It's a triple whammy. And that needs to start to be, to be being addressed. We've got an aging demographic and we've also got more people who are, who are disabled. So all these things, are, are, are coming together in a one huge crisis and and at the end of the day uh why should there be a a, a, a secretary of state for, for disabled people because there are millions and millions and millions of us that's why and we're underrepresented it's absolutely shocking so Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. You make an important point that we are, disabled people are one in four of the population, yet we're not adequately represented uh, in society or the economy. Before I go to the next uh, speaker, we do have the poll results. Um, so we have um, around a third of people who are caring for a friend or family, around 10% of people online provide over 50 hours um, of care per week. Um, around a fifth of people say that they've had to give up uh, to care for a family uh, member or friend. Um, only 5% of people think that the current care allowance is adequate. Everybody thinks this is an issue for the cooperative party. So we'll be making sure that the cooperative party knows that loud and clear. And everyone thinks that the cooperative party should run a campaign to push parliament to an immediate and substantial increase in the amount of care allowance. So that's great. We do have another set of six questions, which I'll bring in shortly. Before I go to the panel for some reflections, and I will ask them to be quick reflections because of time, um, Saxon, if you want to um, take the floor, so to speak. Uh, no, I pressed the hand by accident. I'm really sorry. I missed a lot of the um, discussion. No, no, it's all right, Sandra. I meant Saxon. Are you able to unmute yourself, Saxon? Can um, Chantel or Izzy, can you uh, send um, an ask to unmute message to Saxon, please? Uh, yes, I have done. I don't, I don't know. Um, hopefully it's gone through, but I think there might be a couple of technical issues on Saxon's side. Oh, OK. Saxon, we'll see if we can bring you in uh, later. Don't worry about oh, it. Uh, I've, oh, I've no, unmuted. there we are. Hello. Hello, Saxon. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not in the situation which obviously most of the people participating who've had um, through most of their lives have had disability. And I think the case that's being made for those people to be seen as a particular group that needs particular um, support is a very important one which the Carp Party could um, Cam, uh, campaign on, but I'm I've I've got the problems of visual impairment and the sort of problems you get as you get into your nineties. But I do live in a in a set of twenty eight flats with a warden, and where there is some support, and 
the one thing I thought was important in the white paper is they are talking about providing much better housing and aids and adaptations because I think it's really, really important that we prevent older people from having to need care because most of us don't want to be in that situation. We want to be independent, we want to live um, like everyone else. And so while I think there's a huge problem for people who've got um, the sort of issues that's being talked about, I think we really, prevention is really important because that will reduce the problem. The other thing is I'm from Devon and our branch is very, very keen to set up a social care cooperative and we think it's important to work with our trade unions and I don't know whether the co-op parties had any discussion with how you encourage people in the care sector to get interested in forming co-ops and I think a co-op which included both the users and the providers would be the way to start building real community care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tucker. You make an important point there about um, keeping people in their homes as long as possible, and that has been Labour policy for quite some time. So I know that Liz Kendall in particular is pleased that the government's finally taking on Labour recommendations. In terms of co-op care, we have two experts on our panel, so I'm going to throw over to them. Cheryl, over to you. One of the things that we've been uh, lobbying for for a long time within the co-op movement, Mervyn and myself within our uh, cooperative change agents, is for a multi-stakeholder cooperative uh, care that is exactly as, as you say, that includes everybody who is involved in that care. That's what cooperation is. And if anybody has had to try to negotiate care, it is in itself a form of cooperation. And one of the things that we need to move away from in social care is the cooperative movement's very rigid association of all types of cooperation as businesses. And we need to move this into the future. As Mervyn says, not just carrots and coffins, but beyond the retail societies and into the idea of cooperatives that are social, principle seven, community, and that some cooperatives are not businesses, they're services. And that's a very different language. It's a very different attitude. I'm on the CCIN, which is the Cooperative um, Council's Innovation Network. And I'm trying to persuade them of this. And also we've just got on CCIN, a colleague of Mervyn and myself, Paul Bell, who's a national officer for Unison. So we've been doing a lot of work with the trade union movement and I can see our secretary nodding there because we've been doing work with Unite so that we can get the local authorities to move away from an idea of commissioning a business to provide services and to commission a community to provide services and that that is a service I, I accept totally I'm not a fool that there is a business element but what I'm saying is the main focus of a care cooperative should not be the business of trading in people, in human beings, but in supporting people to come together as cooperators to identify and to deliver around their own solutions that are co-produced, that come together. And one of the main problems we've got with that is we've got to move the cooperative movement itself into thinking differently, but also bringing in the point about the DWP. As disabled people, as older people, we are surveilled more than we are cared for at the minute. And that whole, the link between health and the DWP means that some people don't even get a diagnosis. That there are DWP workers, I don't know if you know this, that are actually in GP surgeries who can go into your notes and can persuade your GP and your care workers to change your diagnosis so that you are not able to qualify for PIP and similar benefits. And that's the reality of the lives that we are living. And the situational 
management that we've got. So to pick up on Duncan's point, yes, a model of social care uh, that is socially based and not medically based, but it, that is situated within a financial modeling where we are seen as disposable people because we are not earning, therefore we are not valued, therefore we are not valuable, therefore they will not put any budgets in around our lives. Our lives and the people who care for us do not matter to these people. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Mervyn, I'm going to bring you in if you want to add anything, but would you mind awfully being quick? I'm conscious of time. You've not muted, unmuted yourself, Mervyn, by the way. Yeah, as far, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, as far as Andrew's point is concerned, I think it's interesting that the white paper uh, has actually reflected the all our futures narrative around the purpose of social care. Uh, and that's that's encouraging. And I totally agree with Andrew uh, in relation to uh, the point he makes about broadening out, which I hope the cooperative party can do. As far as Anthony's point is concerned, or going around social care, um, we had a, a cabinet minister uh, in the days of better government for older people who had a cabinet responsibility for older people's issues. And let me just tell you this, uh, we had several secretaries of state, uh, both in the cabinet office and at DWP. One of the secretaries of state was actually Alan Johnson, and he was interviewed I think on a panorama problem, and he didn't even know that he was the cabinet uh, representative in relation to older people. So I'm, I've got mixed views. What I would say, Anthony, is that my preference would be rather than a cabinet minister having the brief uh, that England introduce a commissioner um, for in relation to disability in the same way that Scotland and Wales has done it. And that is an independent commissioner that holds the government to account in relation to service responses. And I certainly agree with Saxon. Uh, the issue around access, uh, around aids and adaptations, and so on and so forth. We must remember that in terms of local government, it is means tested and there is an eligibility criteria. And therefore, what we've learned over the years, the eligibility criteria is a rationing process that removes people from receiving care to those who are at the very highest needs. Uh, that's all I can say in relation to that. Thank you very much, Mervyn. Uh, we have now the second set of questions, if that's OK. I hope I haven't just sprung that on you, Chantal. There we are. Great. So it's another six questions. So it's do you think carers should be given the same employment rate as parents? Strongly agree, agree, neither disagree or strongly disagree. Is Do you think carers should be trained to a minimum standard like child minders are? Strongly agree, agree, neither disagree, strongly disagree. And then it's, do you think the cooperative party should run a campaign to promote the development of cooperative care agencies, seed funded by regional government? Our cooperative care agency, the sort of things that uh, Cheryl and Mervyn have been talking about. So that's again strongly agree, disagree, neither disagree or strongly disagree. Do you think the cooperative party should run a campaign to promote the local access of talking therapists? Again, strongly agree, agree, neither disagree or strongly disagree. Do you think the cooperative party should run a campaign to promote the local access of respite but I should just say this will be one campaign with lots of features rather than six different campaigns um, but again strongly agree disagree neither this uh, you know what I mean do you think the cooperative party should run a campaign to promote the local access of mental health or again same uh, responses uh, so if you wouldn't mind answering those uh, we will go to Jane first. I'm very conscious of time. We've only got nine minutes left. So I'm going to take Jane. I'm going to look at the chat box and then I'm going to ask for Mervyn, uh, Cheryl and uh, the other speakers to reflect back because we've only got nine minutes left. So Jane? Yep, I'll be quick. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, it 
I'd like to come back to uh, Mervyn's point on the social housing white paper. Um, uh, it's uh, obvious that there are no MPs here um, on our um, session tonight. Um, I'd like to know how we um, could potentially engage with the Cooperative Party Parliamentary Group um, to uh, get, get over uh, some, or talk to them about some of the issues, how we can give them ammunition to go forward in, in the House, in the Chamber, to talk about some of the things that we're talking about. Um, it's all well and good, us just talking about it here, but we need to be able to give them ammunition to help them in the chamber when they're talking about, you know, the, the things that the, the, the current government are trying to bring in and, and why they're wrong and how they could be better, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to request to HQ, um, please, um, that the parliamentary group are given access, direct access to this video and ask them to watch it um, and ask them to engage with us um, so that we can help them so that we can help them with their discussion, their conversation in Parliament. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jane. I can't promise that, but I will be encouraging Chantal and Izzy uh, to pass the video um, on. So just looking at the chat, uh, Cheryl just put, please keep in touch with the committee. Yes, please do. Uh, we haven't obviously been able to speak to everyone um, tonight uh, because of time, but please do get in touch with any um, points you have to make. Andrew said um, talking therapy is one step, but we actually need a more comprehensive um, set of uh, policies. Uh, Joseph makes a very, Joseph, sorry, jo I still am your mum there. Joe makes a very important point um, that we need to value unpaid carers in the same way as we value paid carers and professionals, as well as we value your carers. And, you know, you make a very important point, you know, £37.25, we wouldn't accept that for professional um, carers as well. Um, Theresa's just put our um, email address in the chat box if you want to talk to us. Uh, lots of anger around, you know, labelling disabled people as scroungers. Social care should be a social enterprise, not for profit. Uh, Duncan mentioned the fact that the white paper comes to no conclusion. Um, you know, and how do we, I need, there's a question there, so I'm going to encourage all of our panellists to answer that. Um, you know, is no pro any progress going to be made in disability rights unless the clinical model is dropped and that the social model is taken up as a primary focus? So please answer that question, speaker, um, if you can. Um, and then we have pretty much everything that's been raised. Chantelle, before I go to the speakers, are we able to bring up the final poll results for the six? So we have. Uh, do you think carers should be given the same employment rights as parents? Pretty much comprehensive. You know, no one disagrees with that. Uh, I can't work out what the exact percentage of agree is. Someone who's better at math can do that. Again, very comprehensive that um, carers should be trained to a minimum standard like childminders. Someone strongly disagrees. Um, be interesting. It, obviously, you don't have to say who you are, but if you can sort of perhaps indicate why you disagree, that would be good. Uh, unanimous that uh, um, there should be a, a promotion of cooperative care agencies funded by regional government. Um, uh, not quite unanimous, but still a majority in favour of running a campaign to promote access to talking therapies. Uh, no one disagrees with the idea that there should, we should promote local access to respite breaks. Um, and then completely unanimous that we should run a campaign to promote the local access and mental health support. We have five minutes and four speakers. Um, so good luck, guys. You've got a minute each. Uh, let's start with uh, Valerie. You've got a minute. Over to you. Thanks, Chair, Ben. Um, I missed part of it, so I apologise. I had uh, connectivity issues. And that's something that's been highlighted, obviously, um, during lockdown and since we had this pandemic, we were once told we couldn't have meetings and do the hybrid approach. We noticed we started to do that. Um, I think going forward again, in terms of social care, we, we've noticed that um, a lot of people still can't access um, the care that they need. And they're told to do this or triage and phone calls and it's not enough. So I guess going forward, we need to take a more holistic approach and um, just try and be um, a lot more kinder and, and fairer 
and find the funding because I know it's out there and I really want to advocate that we do do a campaign and I think Jane's point was absolutely spot on that it's good to talk the talk but we need to actually walk the walk so we need local government and also national governments to come together they're representing us on the ground we are doing the, the boots and the work so yeah thank you lovely thank you Valerie for sticking to the time limit I get a big thumbs up from me Jonathan over to you yeah, I'm actually going to um, just quickly come back to the, question, the questions in the first section where carers allowance was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Carers allowance is theoretically £67.60 a week. Last year it was 67.25, so whoopee do they gave you an extra 35p. There's an earnings limit on that of a cutoff. It's not a tapered cutoff, it's a cutoff of £128. Yeah. You have to you have to provide. 35 hours of care to qualify for carers allowance that works out at one pound 91 and a bit per hour on top of that how many people earning 128 pounds if you were to able to earn the full amount and getting your carers allowance you'd actually still be eligible for universal credit so that's where it gets worse because the carers um cut off on universal credit or the allowance the extra allowance you get on that is 30 something like 37 pounds a week so you actually then get your your 30 pounds of your carers allowance treated as income and you use that under the taper anyway so you actually don't get your what they say you should get and you're expected to provide based 35 hours care for you know for for um yeah less than two pounds an hour it's 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 ridiculous and 100 the 128 pound cutoff i'd also point out although it was increased last year it wasn't increased this year that should at least i mean it should be much higher in my opinion but it should at least be going up with with inflation like the other yeah the rest of the benefit rates and things do so actually the whole issue of cares allowance which was touched upon in the the first questionnaire is is a whole other topic that Theresa knows i've spoken passionately about elsewhere uh, and I'm not going to take up any more time, but it is something that we should be looking at in much more detail as part of this as well, is how unpaid carers are treated by the benefit system, because it's it's appalling. And I speak with a lot of first-hand experience and also in dealing with incompetence of the DS, DWP as well, over things as well, because your, 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 your ESA is, is done, if you're on legacy benefits, is done by a different department. Your universal credit is done by a different department. So you then have this situation where you're relying on the, univer the universal credit people and the cares allowance people talking to each other correctly. And if they get that wrong, you end up getting screwed over. And as in my case, being accused of fraud because um, they said you weren't entitled to cares allowance for a certain period. I didn't get it for that period because my earnings were a few pence over the threshold because it was a transition between an old job, part-time job and a new full-time job. So they were threatened me and issued a civil penalty when they hadn't actually paid me the benefit in the first place. And, had, and even even then, had they have had, yeah, it was they still wouldn't have owed the money because they, actually then it wouldn't have. I'd have still been eligible for the universal credit anyway. So it was only a case of one hand would have been paying me instead of the other. So yeah, it's it's a joke. The whole system for care of allowance is a joke. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Mervin, over to you. OK, uh, very quickly, um, the issue of social care being, um, well, let me be clear, since the middle of the 19th century, social care remains embedded uh, within a medical model. And that medical model pathologizes both disability and people living with disability as well as older people. Secondly, the uh, World Health Organization published in 2007 uh, a framework looking at a what they called a livability framework uh, and, and a number of domains. And the last thing I would point out is that why there is no action and has not been action for decades at a political level, as well as other levels, is it's about how we think about disability and how we think about older people. And uh, the point that Anthony makes, DWP is a case in point, or Jonathan. Thank you very much, Mervyn. And over to you, Cheryl. I think we've, we've had a robust discussion about the injustices that are happening to us as disabled and our older people. And 
I have two requests of you all that you keep in touch with us as a committee and that you support us in the work that we do around that social injustice within the cooperative party so that we're campaigning very strongly for the co-op party to take up our case with us and the second is we are part of a wider cooperative movement and so having cooperative care that we think is fit for purpose and suits our needs is something that we can help develop within the movement. So please support us to do those two things, to work within the cooperative movement and to work within the cooperative party to get rid of some of these social injustices. It's, it's way past time. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed that. It was a really informative um, discussion and I apologize for those who wanted to speak and couldn't get in. We've only got an hour. We're going to be doing a lot more work on this, you know, we've heard what you said around unpaid care with access to different types of therapies, we're going to be very busy over the next year, you're going to hear from us, but I hope we um, also hear from you, so please, as uh, Charles says, please get in touch with us, uh, Teresa has put the email in the chat, um, but it's also um, on Google, I hope, as well, um, so thank you very much for joining us, um, and I hope to see you at a future event soon, bye-bye everyone.